Hello, I'm Soraya Mia and you're watching It's About Youth. With the job landscape continuously changing post-pandemic, especially with the influx of Gen Z into the workforce, many companies are faced with challenges retaining talent as well as maintaining productivity. Now, let's talk about what needs to change in terms of policies and perks as well as um, what it takes to meet fresh demands and stay competitive. Now, let me introduce you to our guest for today, Celine Ting. Welcome to Astro Awani. She's the co-founder of Open Academy, as well as Anas Hayan. He is an analyst at Asian Strategy and Leadership Institute, ASLI. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having yeah. us. All right, so I've mentioned earlier, um, you know, challenges in terms of retaining uh, talent, especially with the Gen Z taking over the, the workforce nowadays. Maybe I can start with um, Celine. Uh, what do you think are the key to retaining employees in today's world? Um, I think it's a lot about, sometimes we don't realize this, but I think in the, the, the generational gaps, um, the, the wants and the needs that they have have kind of differed a little bit, especially between even just the millennials and even the Gen Zs. So if you look at what the Gen Zs are actually looking for or what they are looking for in a company, what they value, um, it's kind of a little bit different from, from if, you ask, if you ask a millennial and if you ask a Gen Z what they value uh, in a company, it's very different, mm -hmm. right? So I think in that sense, uh, for any company who is looking to kind of uh, retain it, especially the Gen Z generation or even beyond uh, the Gen Zs themselves, they really have to kind of understand what is it that the Gen Zs are looking for when it comes to a company itself. Uh, they're not just so much in it for the pay. Of course, pay is good, money is good. I mean, that's important and that's something that you need in order to live. But they look a lot at the company itself. What do they represent? What is their value? What is their positioning? What is their branding? What is their stand on certain things? They really value these kinds of uh, things within a company before they have kind of like make a decision to be like, okay, I want to work with this company because I, you know, the pay is okay, but you know, the culture is great. Mm. The branding, positioning, uh, they, they kind of match my values as well. That's why I want to continue contributing to the companies. Uh, a lot of them that go in uh, without understanding the values of the company, oftentimes you'll see that they will slowly kind of like in a, in a very short sp amount of time, they will probably decide to already leave because they realize that even though, you know, you know, it's just for the money, but at the end of the day, they still value these other things a lot more than just, you know, sitting there and trying to work for the sake of working and getting the money um, from there. So I think companies will just need to understand what is it that the next generation actually values and really emphasize on that um, and on those few things. Thinking about, really thinking about their culture, really thinking about their values, really thinking about how do we shout out to these uh, new groups of people about our culture, about our value, what, what do we represent? You know, positioning themselves in that way is the best way for a lot of the Gen Zs to actually identify with your company and want to kind of work for the company. Yeah, I like that point where you, where you mentioned, um, you know, the younger generation likes to identify with the company. Of course, yes, um, perhaps they are working for a company, but mm -hmm. then they would like to also represent the company. And also your earlier point on wages, we, how, how, even though um, it's like, I, I wouldn't say it's a top priority, but it is very, very important, um, especially with you know the economy today. Yes, of course. Um, so maybe let's go on to our next question um, for Anas. What do you think are the you know the main challenges right now when, when we talk about low wages in Malaysia? I think we have to take a step back. When we look at the data, uh, two thirds of graduates nowadays are paid less than two thousand ringgit. And we can say that, you know, in the market, there are jobs that pays you well, but the reality is two thirds are paid 2,000 ringgit and below, right? So that's the reality. And if you look at the job market itself, nationally, unemployment rate is 3.3%. But youth unemployment rate in May 2020 was 10%, but now in July 2024, it's around 6.5%. Uh, so job market has been improving for mm -hmm. the youth. However, we have to look into the details. And as you mentioned, when we talk about low wages, Two thirds are paid two thousand ringgit and below, and then we can see that in comparison with the suggestions, for example, by the central bank, Bank Negara Malaysia, we mentioned that an individual, a single individual, that is working, has to be paid at least two thousand seven hundred ringgit to be to be able to meaningfully contribute to the society. Mm. If you're married, at least four thousand five hundred ringgit. 
and this begs the questions of economic stability and of course upward mobility for our youth nowadays whereby if they are not paid enough how can they survive mm -hmm. in the current economy mm -hmm. because as you mentioned we can always say about our old folks before this maybe they are paid 2000 ringgit 40 years ago and now <laughs> it's still 2000 ringgit is that insane <laughs> i think that's very insane and third when we look into the service i want to echo what Celine mentioned is that nine out of ten uh, gen z's nowadays mm they are looking into providing or looking into purpose in what they do. So they want to do something or the task that they are being uh, responsible to, to be able to know the meaning and the value of what they are doing. So I think it's very important for us and uh, for the Gen Z itself that you know you have your idealism, you know what you want to do, and try to align that in the job market in the company that you're applying to as well. Yeah. So I think the, the challenges would be, number one is of course wages, and number two is how do you balance your idealism and of course uh, your living wage as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think there's a conundrum in that. Mm -hmm. So like, just to kind of like, um, encapsulate what both of you have said, yeah. right? Um, low wages and of also meeting the demands or, or sort of um, becoming that company that a young person wants to work with, right? How do, we, how do we strike a balance? Maybe you'd like to take this? How do we strike a balance? So um, I think it's a lot about value as well. I think um, there is obviously, of course, responsibility on the companies and to uphold their values, right? They have uh, a value, they, they make sure that they uphold a certain value, what, the, what kind of services they offer, what do they provide, what is their branding positioning as a company itself. I think those are things that the companies have to definitely look into and continue pushing for, right? Pushing for the, the, that positioning. Uh, but as on the other end, uh, if you are a Gen Z looking to work, uh, looking to apply for a job, you also need to understand on your end what is your value? What do you offer to the company? What is it that sets you apart from the person sitting right next to you in class right now, right? What mm -hmm. sets you apart? What makes you different from that person? I think that's also something that a lot of a lot of the times the employee per perspective they don't really think about. Mm. I think that's very important to start thinking about it, especially in the youth when you're at, at a young age to think about. Okay, this is the course that I'm studying. This is where I'm going to. This is the job that I potentially want to get. But what is it that I can bring of value? What is the difference? What else can I offer? Because these are the things that the companies will look at uh, to kind of justify. Okay, this person is worth this amount, this person is worth this amount, this person is, you know, valued at this range. Um, so I, I know there is a kind of like a fine line between like, so what is the job scope and what is going above and beyond? Yeah. Um, so I know there's a fine line there and I know that a lot of people <laughs> may, not, may not be very willing to, to do that. But I think it's also thinking about your future as well as an employee perspective, not so much asking you to, you know, uh, do everything out of your job scope and like put in like, I don't know, crazy amount of hours. I don't think that's what we're trying to get at. It's just more of thinking about, okay, what's your next step? Where are you heading towards? You're right now in this position. Where are you going? What are you heading towards? What can you do so that you can kind of grow and kind of step up a little bit? Mm -hmm. So those are the things that maybe it's a little bit out of your job scope, but it's things that you know you want to work towards, right? So I think it's thinking about things like that that will help you, one, be able to very clearly tell your employers that this, this, this is my value, this I know this is what I'm worth, and then also for the companies to come back and say, okay, this person is worth this amount because this is the value that they provide. So it's kind of like striking that balance between mm -hmm. both. So it's not the entirely the responsibility of a company. Of course, it's important for the company to you know, pay fairly and things like that, but it's also on the employees' end to think about it for themselves and kind of step up in that way. Alright, so now let's shift the conversation to talk about policies, you know, what needs to be changed in terms of policies, government policies, and, and so that, you know, the industry's players could also change yeah. because of these. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah. I think every industry would have their own policies that can be implemented. But looking at the macro level, I want to suggest perhaps three things. Number one is that I hope employers can look towards uh, the job market in a more empathetic manner. I think a lot of Gen Zs, they are really surviving paycheck to paycheck and uh, they don't want to live lavishly. They just want to survive 
and they just want to have at least enough saving and to have a dignified salary. I think that's the right word that we can use. Because as we mentioned that the median salary, the latest median salary in Malaysia is 2,800 ringgit. And that means that half of Malaysian are getting 2,800 ringgit and below and 2,800 ringgit and above are the other 50 percent and uh, the reality as I mentioned the central bank has put the dignified salary or living wage of 2,700 so we can see that half of Malaysians are not really paid enough and fairly this comes to the proposal of having a more transparent uh, wage uh, in the job market for example Right now, I really want to commend Kesuma as well as uh, Ministry of Economy in which that in their recent uh, DASA Gaji Progressive or their uh, Progressive Wage Policy, they mentioned the guide of the starting salary for our fresh graduates. For example, if I can read a few, is that uh, for example, auditor, they have to be paid around 3,280. Philosopher slash political scientist like me, a bit sad, 2,240 ringgit. And then for civil engineer, 3,150 ringgit. Mm. What does this mean is that we have a baseline so that our Gen Zs, when they enter the job market, they can know, okay, these are something that uh, I can be paid this much. And if I'm paid below, what are the justification for, from the employer side? Mm. And what are the values that I can propose mm. to them? And what are the skills that I've attained during my degree, for example? And number three is that if we look at the job ratio or the wage ratio in uh, in our country, I think there is a big gap. The the labor share of income in Malaysia, which means if a country or if M Malaysian company are getting one hundred ringgit in revenue, only thirty two ringgit is paid back to the employer. If we compare to our developed countries, for example in the UK or in the US, it's around the range of fifty to sixty percent. So they give back 50% of what they earn to the employee itself. And this begs the questions of, for example, the pay gap between the first level executives and the CEO. For example, in the UK, if you are paid £2,000 in the minimum salary, the Prime Minister is only paid £14,000. So seven times more than the minimum wage. In Malaysia, it's 15 times more, even though PMS doesn't take any salary. And uh, in some industries, the, the pay gap can be three time, 300 times. So that means mm -hmm. you can be paid 2,000 ringgit and your big bosses up there can be paid 700,000 ringgit per month. Mm. So I think we have to recheck whether this is compatible to the job market or not. Okay, like, if we don't want to touch the CEO, at least give them a dignified wage. So that is what we need to do mm. and to ensure that we look into the job market in a more empathetic lens. Yeah. I second that. Now, talking more about you know um, wage transparency per se, uh, Celine, what do you think is the role of the um, employers when it comes to wage transparency and perhaps you know um, giving them a view of of, of what to expect when yeah. they join a company and, and their progression as well? Yeah, I think companies really need to think about the way they would evaluate their employees. I think evaluation or a way to be able to evaluate their value is very important. Whichever methodology that works, there are probably multiple ways of evaluating uh, your employees, your, your teammates and things like that, but pick an evaluation method that makes the most sense for your company. Is it through um, a, a, you know, a methodology like OKRs, KPIs? Like is, is, is it through that, right? It, make that very clear and also make that very clear to the employees as well. When they do come in, this is how they will be measured. This is how they will be evaluated if they check things off the evaluation, mm. they will be promised a certain amount of increment or mm. a percentage. Uh, show them that this is the way that they can, what they can do to move forward and move higher, you know, into uh, the company. This is also a great way for them to be able to see, okay, I have a future here. If I do this, I can move up the corporate ladder, for example, and I can, I know what I'm supposed to do to get there. I think that is, that answers the first part where we talk about purpose. This gives them a sense of purpose. They know what to do to get to where they want to get to. So I think having that kind of evaluation method um, or something to show them uh, how to evaluate themselves is very crucial uh, for a company to just be as transparent as possible. And I would say the second thing is, if we talk about just bonus in general, I think that's something that a lot of employees would love, right? They want to, every year at end, it's like, oh, bonus time. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times, if you ask them, how do you know how much bonus you get? 
right? How do you mm -hmm. know if you get bonus this year? They are not able to answer the question because they just don't know how it's how it works. Like, how do I know if I'm getting this amount or if I'm getting a, a larger amount? Yeah. So I think being able to even just share maybe some form of calculation even to the t employees as well to share with them the calculation of okay, if the company is at this level, we're at you know, we have surpassed all our targets. This is the amount of bonus that you will roughly be able to get. This is the calculation. So that the employees also know what they're working towards, right? They're putting in so much effort. Now I know that my company is hitting here. I want to make sure that I can get the bonus that I get, right? On a personal level. So being able to even share just the calculations. I know certain things are, you know, PNC and it's private and confidential, but you know, just even the calculation and having your employees understand that it's already giving them a lot more power, right? They feel like they're empowered to be able to understand and be, take control of the job that they have mm -hmm. and also the wages that they would like to be able to get to. Yeah, yeah. so they also have a goal and mm -hmm. they know how to you know, achieve exactly. that goal. Um, now, enough about you know, wages because of course we understand it's, it's important, but now let's move on to the next topic on um, perhaps flexibility of work or mm -hmm. work-life balance. That's mm -hmm. also another thing that the younger generation are aiming for they love. you know what <laughs> absolutely <laughs> like um, aside from you know the, the happiness the culture um, good enough wages to survive and then there's also flexibility mm -hmm. um, anyone want to talk about this especially after the pandemic <laughs> uh, thing uh, things have changed people yes. are working from home more um, is this something that maybe more companies would introduce in the future um, I think so it's, a, it's very interesting, right? So during the pandemic, uh, obviously a lot of people, of ev everything is work from home. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after the pandemic, they tried to continue doing work from home. And then a lot of companies now are starting to go all the way back to five full days in the office, mm -hmm. which is honestly not a bad thing per se. But I think in terms of flexibility, it's thinking about what people, I think what a lot of companies fear is that if we give our employees too much flexibility, the work will not get done. I think that they usually equate that with, oh, you're working from home equals, that means my work will get longer, take longer to get done. Uh, but rather than measuring it in that way, or like, you know, seeing them in the office equals them being productive, uh, why not look at the results? Like, look at the end goal, look at the end objective of that specific employee or that campaign or the project that this employee is supposed to be on. If there is a deadline, if there is, uh, you know, certain things that need to be met, and re regardless of if they're in the office five days, you know, nine to five, yeah. but they meet the deadline, does that not mean that they have already achieved what you have set out for them to be able to achieve? Does that mm. not mean that they have achieved the results that they're supposed to? So I think, um, I think changing the perception of uh, measuring your employees' productivity with the time that they spend in the office, I think that needs to kind of shift in today's um, today's society and today's day and age. I know it's very nice to see like, you know, everyone sitting yeah. at the table and, you know, doing their work, but how do you know they're really doing their work, right? With, with technology and everything. So I think it's measuring the end result, measuring did they get there? How long did they get there? Did they meet the deadlines? Uh, did they do what they're supposed to be, uh, what is supposed to be done? I think measuring based on that, it really doesn't matter in between if they go and take a coffee break or if they, you know, uh, do work from home two times a week rather than three times a week or, you know, come into the office three times a week. They are, they are uh, showing you that they are able to do and get the results that they are supposed to get to. I think, to me, I think that's the, the easiest way to kind of change your perception so that flexibility becomes not a question of, oh, should I give my employee, employees? But if you know that this employee is meeting the goal, why not? Mm. Why not the flexibility? If it gives them the reassurance that I want to continue working for this company, they give me the flexibility, they trust me, why not? Isn't that like a great you know, uh, trade-off in terms of your employee satisfaction plus the results that you're trying to get? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what do you think about, you know, um, met or looking, looking at things the way Celine just mentioned earlier, um, kind of changing the, pr the perspective? Because nowadays, of course, uh, some companies still look at coming to the office as being uh, sort of like a formality, right? But then the, the product or the end goal is, yep. is different. Yeah, so do you have anything to say on this? I think I truly agree with what <laughs> you mentioned because I think flexibility is something that Gen Z, Gen Z truly yearns, right? They really love being able to work from home and they will take this, that, that uh, particular factor as one of the factors while choosing a job. Uh, if I can share, like I have a, had a friend who just changed job because that job gave him two days at home, for mm -hmm. example. So I think this is a really big thing 
that mm, the, the employees nowadays would have to take into the factor mm -hmm. because it's not only about wages as you mentioned it's also about the environment it's about the vibe whether you know how do you uh, appreciate your employees and of course you know all of these flexibilities can be given but from the flip side mm. from the employee side you have to know that you have a goal to achieve you know that you have a purpose that you have to do uh, responsibility that you need to do because when given the flexibility it is important for you not to break that trust from your employer because um, I think you know breaking that trust would make the perception for the employer to remove all of these benefits that are given. So mm. I think once you're given the chance, once you're given the perks and the benefits, do that to the fullest and perhaps pay it forward later. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now let's talk a little bit about upskilling and reskilling um, and the challenges that companies mm. perhaps uh, face. Yeah. Would you like to take this? Sure. Um, I think oftentimes with upskilling and reskilling, right now, um, I think. Malaysian companies are going towards a direction which is great. I think they are starting to invest a little bit more in L&D, invest a little bit more of upskilling, having a plan and things like that, so which I think it's great. And obviously with HRDC and yeah. the, the accessibility to trainings and things like that has become a lot more accessible than before. So I think with that in general, it's a great start. Um, but with a lot of companies, it's often worked kind of like backwards a little bit when it comes to learning and development. It sort of comes from, oh, um, the, the, the plan doesn't really relate with the, with the uh, kind of like the objective or the problems of the company itself. It kind of comes from, oh, I think we need this kind of training, so let's look for this kind of training, right? Which is not wrong because obviously you still want people to be able to upskill, but oftentimes the reason why people are upskilling or reskilling is to, uh, there are a few things. There's one, which is obviously there is a, a gap, right? There is a challenge and we know that without uh, the team understanding this specific skill set, knowledge and things like that, they're not able to, to rise up to the challenge. Yeah. Or number two is that maybe you're expanding in terms of the job scope or expanding in terms of the roles. Maybe your, your team is changing roles, changing departments or shifting and things like that. And they will require the skill sets to be able to do that. Um, so oftentimes these are the two reasons why people require those things. But a lot of the times it's not reflected in the learning and development or the upskilling and reskilling side of things. So rather than seeing it as a totally separate thing, it's always great if a learning department or an L&D department works very closely with the team in general, mm -hmm. understanding from the upper management, understanding from the team to be like, okay, so what is your biggest challenge of the year? Like, What are you hoping to achieve in your departments? What are you looking for? And then working your L&D plan according to what the departments or what the upper management More is trying to up. get to, correct, yeah. right? Where, where are we trying to get to? If you know that, okay, we're this year we want to do uh, digitalization, we want to digital transform and our company and things like that. So then what are the things that you need to look for, right? So should there be more digital centric kind of courses? Understand about uh, from the teams, like w amongst the teammates themselves, what are some of the gaps? Because oftentimes they go too high or they go too low and then, you know, then the, the teams cannot relate even with the courses themselves. So I think working very closely with the other departments, the other teams are very crucial for an L&D department in order for upskilling and reskilling to be successful. Uh, and I think that's, that's really very important. So don't silo yourselves. Don't be like, okay, I need these courses. I need to check this off the list. Really work together with the departments and build your L&D plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. Now we have just about two, two to three minutes left. Um, maybe we'll just wrap up the conversation with um, fi your final thoughts. What, what would you suggest or what are your hopes um, within the next few years in terms of policies, in terms of change? We're talking about all of this very optimistically. Uh, would you like to go? Number one, I think Gen Z needs to strategize in their career because according to research, the first job is usually the most important crossroad of your career. For example, if you are choosing the first job that are not suitable to your backgrounds, for example, and does not pay as much as you would like, so that would hinder or that would be an obstacle for you once you try to get another job. Because according to research, 43% of graduates, only 43% of graduates receive jobs that match their qualifications. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the other 57%? So they are in an underqualified job or they are overqualified for that job, that particular job. So I think we have to relook into this. And of course, I mentioned about which transparency. You need to know that there is a guidance that you can follow. There's also guidance from the government side and on the flip side from the uh, 
uh, external sector is for example websites such as Glassdoor or we also have Malaysian Pay Gap which you mentioned uh, where it's a community based uh, platform for you or for Malaysian to share their wages anonymously so know your worth and lastly I want to know that not everyone would have this privilege of choosing their own jobs mm. because not everyone would come from the same backgrounds. So this is why intervention from the government is important. We have programs such as My Step, Protege, Lenyak College, G's, right? But the market now for that particular program is around 2,100 ringgit, which is, I mentioned, below the living wage mm -hmm. as I stated. And it's around the minimum wage proposed by UNICEF itself, which is 2,100 ringgit in comparison to 1,500 ringgit. So if hopefully you know, in the near future, the government can really look into this and give a more dignified salary for our young Gen Z and our young generations. Mm -hmm. Yep, it starts from, I guess, policies from the government and perhaps you know, the private sector would follow suit. But that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for joining the conversation. And thanks everyone at home for watching. I'm Saramia and we'll see you again.